Welcome to the St. Louis Regional Freightways Virtual Freight Week STL 2021. I'm Mary Lamy, the Executive Vice President of Multimodal Enterprises, a business enterprise of bi-state development. Freight Week STL is in partnership with the Inland Marine Expo hosted in downtown St. Louis. Today is the third day of events, and our topic is how the St. Louis region's global connectivity is enhanced through dedicated rail service through one of the world's largest deep water harbors, the Port of Virginia. First, we'd like to start off with thanking our sponsors, starting with our presenting sponsors, Global Gateway Logistics, Burns McDonnell, the Lockmiller Group, Crawford Murphy or Antilly or CMT, Castle. Our supporting sponsors include Hauser Group, the Jerry Costello Group, and our associate sponsors are SIBA, SICAP, Washington University, the Boeing Group, CDI Engineering, and Jefferson County Port Authority. Our guest today is Aaron Katrincha, the Port of Virginia Director of Break Bulk, Roll On, Roll Off, and Rail Services. He is responsible for developing and implementing comprehensive break bulk and roll on, roll off sales plans. This also includes rail business development initiatives that extend the Port of Virginia's reach to inland markets for both containerized and non-containerized markets. Prior to joining the Port of Virginia in February of 2019, Aaron ex gained extensive experience in the transportation, ports, and shipping industry serving in a number of roles with Norfolk Southern Railroad. And through that role, he became familiar with the St. Louis region's market and visited America's Central Port in Granite City, Illinois. Aaron, welcome. And thank you for participating in today's event. I had the privilege of touring your facility about two years ago and the size and complexity of your uh, operations was absolutely overwhelming. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for your uh, pleasure to be here as well. All right, Aaron. So as you know, the Port of Virginia is one of our region's primary gateways to the world, and that connectivity is provided by two Class 1 railroads, Norfolk Southern and the CSX Railroads. So let's start with our first question, and if you don't mind introducing us to the Port of Virginia's 21st century infrastructure, your technology investments, and the containerized cargo market. Absolutely. Well, uh, again, thank you for having me. I wish I could be there uh, in person, but you know, during these times, this is this is the way we're doing this. So, uh, just happy we could we could connect in that way. Um, it's a really exciting time at the Port of Virginia right now. I mean, you, you said you were here two years ago, and even since then, a lot has happened. Um, you know, we're working quite a bit on our terminals uh, to bring them into the future uh, as to what's happening in the shipping community and be relevant uh, on, on, you know, on the East Coast and then how we connect around the world. So, you know, let me first just talk about the Port of Virginia, how we're set up, the assets that we have, the terminals uh, are our assets and, and certainly our people as well. Um, we are a, a little bit different than other ports in the, in the sense that we control not only the ownership or the, or the lease of our terminals, but we also operate our, our terminals as well. Um, you know, we are a uh, you know, through the state and through the Port Authority. Um, we also have a wholly owned subsidiary uh, called Virginia International Terminals, and that's where we do our, our operations and our commercial contracts through uh, as well. So that's that's just a little bit different setup uh, than some of the other ports around the country. Uh, we own and we operate uh, six terminals. Uh, two of them are inland terminals, um, you know, one connecting by barge, uh, the other connecting uh, by rail. Those aren't as relevant probably to, to this audience here in St. Louis. So I'm going to really focus on, you know, really the four that are, that are in our Harbor area. Um, so, you know, between the two, of, or between the four of those, uh, two of them are dedicated to our container side and then two are dedicated to our, uh, what we call our multi-purpose side or non-containerized side. So I'm going to first focus really on, um, the two you know, container side and talk about our container franchise that, that we're building here. Um, a lot of the work that we've done over the past uh, two to three years has really been on the container side. We've spent uh, you know, almost now $900 million uh, within the past three years and we've got some ongoing projects uh, as well. So uh, first, you know, talking about Norfolk International Terminals. Um, this is uh, one of our dedicated container terminals, 
It's about 567 acre terminal. Uh, and we've just put in $350 million into that terminal uh, and essentially increased the capacity there by 40%. So now we can handle up to 1.2 million containers a year at, at that terminal because of work that we just completed uh, this past November. Uh, we also brought that terminal up to uh, a different efficiency standard than what it was before. The, the way that the stacks work there are, are highly efficient now, uh, running on a semi-automated system. Um, so really the takeaway point for, uh, for, for your audience here is um, the containers move in, they move efficiently through the stacks and they can move on to the vessel and vice versa com coming off of the stacks. Uh, we've also at that terminal purchased two new ship to shore cranes, which are uh, 170 feet tall. They're the biggest in the Americas. We've got two more on the way uh, coming coming this uh, in the next six months. Um, so what that does is it, it allows us to not only handle the largest container vessels, uh, calling our port area, but it also um, you know allows an efficiency. There's a certain productivity in those cranes. That now gives us 16 total of these of these large cranes, these super post Panamax cranes uh, that are essential for handling the largest uh, vessels that, that, that come into this port area. Um, secondarily, you know, we've got another terminal, Virginia International Gateway, which we, we did a similar amount of work that was finished back in 2019. So that, you know, there we increased our, our rail throughput, our rail capacity, we doubled that there. Um, and so, uh, you know, all of this work together uh, really is to increase the efficiencies, increase the capacity. Um, you know, we've essentially doubled our capacity, um, you know, at both terminals and allowed us to, you know, really move into the future on throughput, efficiency, capacity, and then also, uh, you know, the ability to get those on and off the rail. So, Aaron, with that said, you, you've talked about throughput and efficiency. How are you moving that cargo um, what type of commodities are, are in the containers and order of magnitude, what volumes are you actually moving through your port? Yeah, so when we look at when we look at the volumes, um, I can just tell you, you know, and you probably see it in the news, um, we've got quite a bit of volume trying to ramp back up. And, and it really, um, you know, started last fall, obviously, as, as things, uh, you know, COVID began to open back up and the supply chain did. Um, November was an all-time record month for us uh, at the port. And in March, we almost beat that record, which is, is saying something because uh, yeah, it was, I think it was short by about 354 units. Um, and that's really saying something because March doesn't usually beat November. November is usually a peak time uh, for us. So uh, you know, we're handling roughly, um, you know, when you speak in TEUs, which is 20 foot equivalents, so like a 40 foot uh, container equals two, you know, we're moving about 3.2 million TEUs a year. Uh, but, but really what that equates to is about 1.7 uh, containers a, a year. And, you know, really when we look at that, um, we're very balanced, you know, both we're, we're sitting in the middle of the coast. Uh, so, you know, imports, exports, uh, we're extremely balanced. Where that's really important is on our rail side. We, we, we handle, uh, you know, anywhere between um, 32 to 38% of our business moves by rail. Um, so the, the railroads don't want, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult network to run if you're moving in a bunch of empty cars to be able to handle an imbalance of imports and exports. So, you know, we, we certainly offer quite a bit in that way as to the, the balance of our traffic. And that's, that's good for the shippers uh, as well. That creates an efficiency there. Okay. So, and hold that thought about the rail component, because we want to get sure. a little bit later. But Absolutely audience today are primarily shippers and carriers, but we also have other industry leaders. So if you don't mind, um, we understand that ocean carriers are a key player in international logistics. Help us, who are they? Um, and what role do they play? And what role does your port have in determining the shipping routes, both domestic and global? Yeah, the um, so 
the ocean carriers have gone through quite a, you know, if, you've, if you've tracked them at all uh, over the last, let's say two decades, uh, they've gone through quite a bit of consolidation. Um, you know, these are, there's different ownerships within the ocean carrier, or the container carrier uh, realm. Um, and so what, it, what has happened, you know, is there was a, a fierce competition, obviously, for, for the volume and um, through consolidation, that's allowed you know, one their financials to get uh, get back straight. The larger vessels have also given them some efficiencies, um, and then and then thirdly, they've combined into uh, several alliances to work together um, to share vessels uh, to create some efficiencies there. But what you have left uh, really is you know less than twenty um, that, that we really work with. I would say more like in the twelve to fifteen range of a mix of Asian and European based uh, companies. And, you know, those, those ocean carriers, uh, you know, they, they really control the freight from, or they, they are the constant, you know, that container is the constant from door to door, if you will. And, you know, really uh, the port is, is, a, is a piece of that network. The rail is a piece of that ne- network. And then obviously trucks are a piece of the network as well at either end. So, um, the way that the business is set up is it really sort of all runs, runs through them uh, in, in some ways. You know, we do not do our direct business on the container side with the, ocean, I mean, with, um, the, the beneficial cargo owner that's in the box. We, we actually do it through the ocean carriers. So all of our uh, contracts are set up w- with them directly. And then we create services uh, uh, with them as well. And they sell that back to the community as to the sort of door-to-door supply chain. So Aaron, are they, is the ocean carrier the one who is deciding when a container is in Asia, do they decide how that, that container is gonna, if it's gonna go to the East Coast or the West Coast, and then how it will then be shipped to the interior of the, the US? Yeah, I think the, the you yeah, know really the beneficial cargo owners do have obviously a lot of uh, sway with with that and the routing decisions. But but in the grand scheme of things, um, they're they're buying a service and they're they're buying the, the the best way to get to from door to door. And so there are, there are options. And so we we really feel like all that work that we put into our terminals that I alluded to earlier goes a long way to making that door-to-door connection uh, highly efficient. And so, you know, if you, if you look at our services today, we have a, the most services that we have are with Asia. You know, we've got 11, 11 Asian services today. And, uh, you know, that, that sort of speaks to the transition because it used to be that, um, you know, really the Trans-Pacific trade uh, connected the West Coast and the, and, and the, Asia. Um, our largest trading partner, both import and export, is China you know, on okay. the East Coast here. And so that's Suez Canal service, uh, you know, coming through the Suez Canal. Uh, and, and then also, you know, through the Panama Canal as well. Uh, it's been a really big connection for us and something that, that we've, we've really, it's really allowed to uh, us to increase our volumes to these record levels. But we really, you know, we have 30 weekly services with, with these ocean carriers uh, a week. And that gets shippers in the St. Louis community or any of our connections inland, uh, a lot of options. Um, you can, you can get basically to anywhere in the world, uh, from the port of Virginia, Asia, Africa, Caribbean, uh, Central America, Europe, India, uh, sub, subcontinent, Middle East, Mediterranean, South America, you name it. Um, and, and we've got that connection to you, uh, for you, uh, to those, to those areas, to and from those areas. So, Aaron, let me ask you this. So, there are a number of ports um, along the East Coast. What criteria does the ocean carriers use as far as what port to go to? And I, I know you have relationships with your sister ports, but how do you position the Port of Virginia to be a, a port of choice? You know, the, I think the thing that shippers are looking for the most is, are, are really threefold. I mean, they're looking for reliability. Uh, and reliability comes from, you know, we're really, if, if you look at what a port does, you know, we, we are basically the transition between land and water, you know, so we have to transition that box uh, in, in the most 
uh, efficient manner possible. And that's why, you know, it's hard to, to talk. You know, there's a lot of detail to what we've done to our terminals, but really the takeaway point is we are getting your the box, you know, from a very, through a very complicated system, uh, through our inland channels, you know, through our terminals and, and onto these ultra large con- container vessels as quickly as any port. Um, and, and we're really proud of that. Uh, it's, it's also about, you know, you've seen this, I think the throughput is being tested quite a bit right now. And that we're, whenever we hit those record levels, we also were keeping our record turn times, our record, uh, you know, metrics of getting a, a box onto the rail in less than 48 hours. Um, you know, so, and then I said, like I said, the, uh, the, the ship to shore cranes are as efficient as they have in the Americas. So every single piece there, there's no cog in that, you know, that, that part of the supply chain for us. And so I think that's something that they look for. You know, the other thing too, is the largest container vessels that we're handling here on the East coast and that we've handled, uh, was this past year, it was a 15,000 TEU vessel you know, these 20 foot equivalents uh, that, we're, that we're speaking in. We don't offload all 15,000 here. You know, it, it's simply just not a reality today. Um, but what they're looking to do, what these container lines are looking to do is to have a rotation. Uh, so kind of a multi-port rotation here, let's say on the East Coast to take a segment of boxes off, uh, at, you know, at each location. Three is usually typically sort of the magic number on how many rotations you need to offload, you know, that cargo. And the, the efficiency for, for a beneficial cargo owner is uh, really paramount. Um, and then that connection inland, especially to markets like St. Louis, how quickly can you get off and get, get to your destination uh, and how efficiently and how reliable and that's something that we're really offering um, you know, to the supply chain, to the shippers, to the ocean carriers, because these assets are, are they want to turn those as quickly as possible too. So, you know, when, when I when I talk about the ocean carriers having, you know, a lot of the uh, control in the, in the process, um, they want to call ports that they can get in, get offloaded, get as many boxes offloaded, get them to the, the markets as quickly as possible. Uh, because they're controlling that piece too, and uh, we offer that. Okay, so now that we've established the Port of Virginia plays a significant role in global logistics, help us understand the St. Louis's role with your operations in terms of scheduled service by Norfolk Southern and the SpaceX, and the benefits to our region's manufacturing industry. Absolutely. Um, So, you know, our, the the rail, the way that the rail works for intermodal, and and right now we're only talking container and I I will shift over to sort of a non-container view of what we do here at the port as well. But for non-container, you know, the the intermodal, what's called the intermodal network for the railroads, it runs very much like um, what what folks know as an airline service type um, service. And so basically these are terminal to terminal uh, coming from our terminals, our, our uh, port terminals and going between the, both the CSX and the NS terminal out in, you know, out in the market that we have scheduled services to. We have two, you know, we both have, uh, you know, both railroads have dedicated services uh, to, to St. Louis. And I'll go through those schedules in a second, but just wanted to talk uh, really about how the network works. Um, so really, uh, you know, we have a, a number of services in the Midwest today that we connect to. Um, and with the railroads, similar to our schedules uh, on the ocean carrier side, we have a daily, um, you know, basically a daily train uh, or a five to seven day t- uh, train for each one of those. And, and essentially, if that box is available to get on the train at a at a, uh, what's called the cutoff time, it will then be made available at the other term you know, the terminal on the other side, essentially by X day. So it's a very um, concrete schedule. Uh, you know, the, the ocean carriers can uh, sort of set their set their watches to it, um, and you know both railroads essentially can offer that based on you know the 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 quickest. Um, service that they can set up between 
you know, both both the inland terminal and, and the port terminal. You know, what we have for St. Louis, um, you know, Norfolk Southern today has a six day a week schedule, both on the import and the export side. And they essentially can have, you know, if we make, uh, once we're able to, let's say on the import side, load the train, uh, it's made available on the fourth day, uh, in, in four days, essentially, in St. Louis to be picked up by a truck and driven to the uh, end destination. Um, you know, Norfolk, and I will say Norfolk Southern's terminal is at, um, you know, for anybody that's you know, local there is uh, 333 East Cary Avenue, St. St. Louis, uh, Missouri. And then similarly, uh, CSX also on the import side, they have a five day a week schedule and it gets there in four days as well. Um, on the export side, it's, it's a one day a week, but that's also you're driven by volume. So that ebbs and flows if they're, you know, once there are new customers, um, that can increase. So, so really once a schedule is there, it's just a matter of the, the volumes dictating how many days a week that, that schedule goes. And the CSX terminal is in East St. Louis, uh, Illinois, uh, 3900 Rose Lake Road. And that's the connection there. So we're really proud of our, um, our rail connections. Uh, like I said, we handle um, between 32 and 38% of our business. That's, uh, that is uh, the most on the East Coast by any, uh, by any of the ports um, as a percentage of, of what we do. So you, that, you know, that tells you how much we, we do rely on our partners uh, on the rail side. Um, we work very closely with them. Um, you know, going back to some of the you know, investments that we were talking about, like I said, at one of our container terminals, we recently doubled the capacity there because of how important the rail is. We're also uh, increasing the capacity in the next couple of years at our other terminal um, by 40 percent. So we're building. We're building for the future uh, for rail. So, Aaron, you had mentioned before with the ocean carriers, you know, at times they really are the leaders in deciding what those shipping routes look like. With the fact that you've mentioned that scheduled rail service we have in and out of the St. Louis region, um, does that factor into that decision-making process um, for the ocean carriers when they're deciding, you know, um, where that that product is, is their destination is going to be within the Midwest? Absolutely. I mean, they you want to find that you know the, the most direct service. These boxes are theirs. You know, they, it's their part of their assets. They they want to get those back as quickly as possible. So, it's important to get them into a market and then get them back out of a market. Um, you know, as efficiently as possible. And we you know we have the most direct rail service uh, to and from St. Louis. So we offer the you know that's not only just offering the the cargo owners, but it's also offering the the container lines a very efficient product uh, to and from, you know, a port that's got a lot of options, a lot of services for them. So Aaron, not that we're looking for compliments, but we do respect your experience and your role at the uh, Port of Virginia. So we are interested in your perspective as far as what our region's logistics advantages are. You mentioned the intermodal yards in East St. Louis and North St. Louis. By both of those locations, we continue to invest in our infrastructure along Illinois Route 3, along the I-70 and 270 um, uh, alignments. So if you don't mind, we we're interested to, to see what your perspective is as it relates to the rail industry and, and how that ties in with your operations. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the having a an intermodal market tied to both class one railroads uh, going east, because I'm, I'm certainly talking about the east coast here, um, is a big advantage for for St. Louis. Certainly the, with the way the trucking market is and trucking capacity, you know, it's difficult to, um, uh, you know, really get to the coasts being in the middle of the country by a truck. It's rail is really the most efficient way. And so, the advantage you, you have there is you have very nearby terminals that both class ones are tied to, and then they're connected in, into, you know, the Port of Virginia, which is, uh, as I've alluded to, we're building for the future. We, we can get you, uh, you and your customers around the, around the world to really any location you want uh, and very flexible options, um, you know, between two, we have two terminals, you know, with a lot of throughput. And then also the, the options we have for, for services 
and multi-services with a number of different carriers. So the flexibility, the reliability, the efficiencies, um, you know, I think that's, that's really key. You can't really just manufacture that. You, you have that. So I think building off of that and sort of knowing those connections is, um, is key. Okay, so focusing on the rail, um, as you know, our rail customers in our area include aircraft, automotive parts from General Motors, Boeing, their contractors. It includes food, um, agricultural, coal, fertilizer, steel, and beverage products. We have numerous rail access locations that provide boxcar service. Can you share your thoughts regarding on how these connections and services impact growth opportunities for manufacturing logistics companies in our region? Absolutely. Um, you know, sort of shifting to the the whole umbrella, I guess, for 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 the Port of Virginia, and just and not just talking about containers. Yeah, you know, what we really strive for is is offering as many flexible options for for our shippers uh, and, and our customers. And you know, really, when I talk about those four terminals, kind of going back to the harbor area. Um, you know, with two dedicated container terminals and then two dedicated, not we'll call it non-container terminals or multi-purpose terminals, it, it gives shippers, you know, in St. Louis a really, um, you know, a lot of options from which to choose. When we talk about containers, you know, there's different ways of moving in containers as well. You don't necessarily have to move the entire way door to door in a container. You can also move to the coast, not in a container, get transloaded in a container and then move via a container vessel. Or you can move the entire way, not in a container, you know, let's say in brake bulk or row row service. So um, our other two terminals that I was speaking of, Newport News Marine Terminal and Portsmouth Marine Terminal, are two where we we don't do any container call uh, vessel calls. We, we have brake bulk and we have roll on roll off calls. And so basically what that means is, you know, the brake bulk call would be things that are loose, you know, palletized, you can actually see the cargo, you know, and, and we'll, let's say we'll offload a, uh, a box car and you load it directly onto the, onto the vessels loose uh, in a brake bulk form and it goes into the hold of, of, of the ship. Similarly, row row, we, you know, we do that as well. We're, uh, the same type product is is it's put onto what's called a, a mafi uh, if it's not on its own wheels and then it's it's rolled onto the vessel so we we've, we've got those services as well and we've got connections to both railroads to those those terminals so this part of the network really is different you know you kind of uh, you look at the intermodal um, aspect where it's sort of to the terminal and a truck has to pick it up um, and so there's no real direct container rail service, this side of the house, when you, when you talk about box cars, or you talk about hopper cars, or you talk about flat cars, uh, center beams, you know, all the different other types of rail cars, those go in a, a completely different network uh, on, on both railroads. And those go directly to your, your customers that have rail sidings. Um, and those can connect in directly to our port terminals as well. So never goes on the road, comes directly from the facilities and in. And, and, and. Um, and then going back to that flexibility of, well, maybe you have some, um, some shippers that want to, you know, not have to load out or, or have, don't have access to a container out there, uh, or can't get access to enough containers out there, uh, in St. Louis, we have the flexibility if they send them into the port to transload them into containers as well. So that's a, that's a whole nother, you know, sort of flexible option. So we like to, to look at it like any of your shippers out there have an option, you know, here, here at the Port of Virginia and how, whatever way they want to ship and where they want to ship, uh, we want to talk to them about that. We want to, we want to provide that, that best solution for them. So Aaron, can you use your example um, as far as comparing this to a commercial airline versus a chartered plane service? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I like to use that example um, because, you know, some folks go rail a little bit better than others. And I, yes, the, the one thing that we all know is sort of transporting people. And so when you look at the airlines, I kind of look at the airlines versus sort of uh, driving somewhere from your house is, is the, is the non-containerized side. So 
Um, you know, the containerized side being very terminal to terminal, very set services. Um, you know, sometimes you have to have, uh, you know, if you don't have a schedule to a certain place, you know, you're having to drive to sort of the, the nearest airport or terminal, you know, the intermodal terminal. Um, similarly, you know, if you're, if you're far from an intermodal network, which the St. Louis market is not, but, um, but you know, th- th- there might be a reason to not use an intermodal service. You can go direct from your location, um, similar, similar to driving, you know, driving from your house, uh, you know, to, to a location. We do have a di- direct connection there on the non-containerized side. Okay. Um, all right. So we continue to hear how extreme ocean carrier congestion has um, become um, an issue at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. It's been reported that 25 container ships were parked at one time for anywhere from eight to 11 days due to extremely high inbound volumes. We obviously also heard about the delays at the Suez Canal. Do you have any comments regarding these bottlenecks and has the Port of Virginia experienced an increase in containers? Yeah, you know, Similar to what I was alluding to earlier, um, we we almost hit an all-time record for in, in March, which is not a month you typically hit a record in. And um, you know, we're proud to say that that really it, it tested all that work that we've just recently done, those efficiency efficiencies we put in. Our metrics stayed the same, you know, and, and the metrics we look at are our truck turn times, um, you know, the metric. Uh, the, the metric that's important for us on, on rail is how quickly do you get, you know, a box onto the rail car from, uh, you know, from the, from the vessel or vice versa. And we still stayed within that threshold of 48 hours, which is key to us during that time. And, and let me just tell you that, you know, not only did we not miss a beat and, and we were able to accept more vessels than we ever had, um, we, we also, you know, really it was uh, um, the vessels that we, that we did get, you know, some of them were because they, they couldn't get in somewhere else. Um, so it's important to note that, uh, you know, not only, you know, some of these vessels were off schedule, you know, they're, they're coming from other, other places and, and we were able to still within our birth windows, you know, make that time, get them through the stacks, get them, get them offloaded, uh, get them onto the rail, get them on the truck. And get them out the door, and uh, yeah, it's really a testament to not only our operations team and, and the work they're doing out there, um, but but also you know all that work that was put in to make that efficiency. So when those um, shipping routes change because of the supply chain disruption, are those short term shifts, or do sometimes they become long term uh, shifts in those routes? You know, over the years, you see you see these disruptions, and this is a, another unique one, right? Because this this really affected the world. Um, you know, sometimes you see, you know, whether it's a, a weather related uh, disruption or it's a labor um, disruption, um, you know, that that can be a little bit more isolated to a region. Um, this one really affected the supply chain of the world, um, and so I, I think. This was unique. Um, we don't know what the other side of this is going to look like, but what I would like to say is that it, it, you know, it really showed well for the Port of Virginia. You know, it really, we really showed that this is a place that you can rely on. This is a place that has capacity. This is a speed to market, um, you know, port, and um, we'll see if that what that breeds for us on the other side. But I can tell you, we're. We're a major player on, on the East Coast. We, we, uh, we're building for the future to, to be that. Um, we've got very efficient connections. We've got, um, you know, a robust amount of services. And I think all of that sort of just lends itself to more and more growing, um, you know, uh, on the East Coast in general. And then, like I said, with these rotations and the need for the, you know, a rotational, uh, you know, service for these, for these ocean carriers, we're, we've built that. Um, and the one thing I didn't talk about earlier is, you know, by 2024, um, you know, we're, we're already at 50 feet, by the way, that's, that's, was already a leader on the East coast. And that's, what's needed for these ultra large container vessels. Um, and you can see behind me that's sort of coming into the Harbor on, on the left on the, I guess it's my 
my right side is uh, is Virginia International Gateway, and on my on my left is um, is, is Norfolk International Terminals. But that harbor, you can you can see you know the, the proximity and, and how close you know it is to get down that harbor. We're dredging now to 55 feet by 2024, and also what we're doing is we are widening the channel as well. So these ultra large con container vessels can go two way. Uh, today we're not we're not there, but that's going to create just one more line of efficiency. You know, I talk about those cogs in the network, and in, in you know, kind of getting through, um, you know, from water to land and vice versa. That's just one more where we're just trying to stay ahead of the game. We see these vessels getting larger and larger. Um, you know, the vessels on the on the Europe and Asia trade are already at the you know twenty thousand plus TEU, and 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 we see that. Potentially, if the, if the east, you know, once the east coast sort of catches up from an infrastructure standpoint, uh, be, being you know the way that it's going, so uh, we just want to be a leader in that, and that's something that, you know, um, like I said, we want to just be two steps ahead, and and uh, you, you can't you can't get out ahead of this thing, but so much, so we're, we think we're there. Okay, so we can't have a discussion without talking about COVID. So, what are the impacts of COVID on the port to can containerize cargo? the shipping industry, and how does that impact um, the Midwest and regions like the St. Louis region? So, I, you know, the one thing I will say is, and I, I want to go back to our operations group because our terminals never closed, you know, and that's something, that's a real testament um, through this whole thing, um, you know, that really threw all of us through for a loop. I think the entire world was was thrown for a loop with this. And, and obviously the supply chains at either end, the door-to-door, have um, have been disrupted, you know, because uh, it's not easy to to keep a plant going or keep a distribution center going or uh, or what have you while while a pandemic is going on. Um, but that's something that we were able to do, um, and and we've you know certainly come out the other side better for it. Um, we've been more mindful when we when we can be safe and and, and create social distancing. Certainly we. Uh, we had to put in a lot of measures to to keep our our team safe uh, out there in the field and and the, the folks that are considered essential personnel needing to still still be there. Um, we've had to you know talk with our customers maybe in a, in a different way, but that's that's created some efficiencies as well. Um, but I think all in all, the, the thing that I'm, I take from from the COVID situation the most is how you know we're in the supply chain field and how do you how do you respond to disruptions in in the supply chain and this was a major disruption and it still is because it's now we're seeing the back end the pent up demand and you know that's it's really been a nice uh, like i said just a resilient effort uh, by by the port team here both from keeping the terminals open um and then the ebbs and flows of the cargo and and, and just you know, being able to handle that and, and come out the other side and still, you know, keep our supply chain and our customers as, um, you know, efficient and, you know, their cargo moving as efficiently as possible. All right, very good. So, Aaron, is there anything else we haven't touched on that our viewers uh, that are with us today should know? Do we cover all our bases? No, I, I think I, I think I covered it. I mean, I think the, the, the thing to, you know, for the St. Louis market, to, to really take home from this is you, you were in the center of the country. Um, rail is, is a big part of, of what you, what you do. It's a big part of what we do. Um, both of the class one railroads on, on the East coast are, are our partners and we work very closely with them. Um, we have the most direct route for you to get to a major East coast port. And, um, and like I said, once you get here, the box is handled with care. The, the cargo is handled with care. Uh, you have flexible options. It moves through our port very efficiently. Um, and then you have options once you get on the water um, to get, you know, anywhere you really want to go uh, with your cargo. You know, and the other thing I didn't mention, because I know that, um, you know, like agriculture, for instance, is a really big market out there. We are the biggest agriculture exporter um, by, you know, on the East coast, uh, for, you know, when it comes to ports and it's not close. And, and that's something we really, we really covet as well. So, um, but you know, whether it's, um, 
whether it's agriculture, whether it's forest products on, on the export side, whether it's resins, whether it's, um, uh, you know, the plastics, soy, you know, soybeans, um, you know, wood pulp, logs, you know, paper, paperboard, um, you know, you name it, you can ship it here through, through the Port of Virginia. We're, and we've got options. All right, Aaron, you did fantastic. Again, we thank you for your time today share your perspective regarding our region's freight market, the global significance of the Port of Virginia and opportunities for growth between our two regions. So thank you very much. Um, To wrap this up, um, we would like to thank our sponsors. And then as far as Freight Week is concerned, for tomorrow's events, we will host a panel discussion on the region's resiliency and locational advantages that help redevelop a former Ford Motor Company and Chrysler Assembly Plant site and continued activity underway at the General Motors Wentzville Assembly Plant. We'll also be releasing the 2022 Freightway Priority Project List. And Friday, we have two events, a panel discussion on the 60-mile Illinois Route 3 Manufacturing and Logistics Corridor in Southwestern Illinois, and opportunities to repurpose vacant industrial sites through infrastructure and public-private partnerships. And we will also be releasing the Freightway Industrial Real Estate Market Report. So please visit our website, thefreightway.com, for more information. Aaron, again, thank you. We appreciate all your time today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.